Well, summer is here, and the uh, heat is coming. Get ready for it. And uh, some of y'all like it, and some of you don't. And uh, well, it is what it is, right? And uh, that's pretty much what I say about the week I had. It was what it was. And uh, this morning I got up and stiff and sore and, and weary in body, feeling my age. Not old, but I'm still feeling it. And uh, sat in my favorite recliner and sitting there with my Bible and looking out the door there. And I just feel weary in spirit and body. And I'm looking out there and this bird lands on the banister right outside of my door. And, uh, and I'm looking, I'm like, and, and, and there's curtains on that door, so it's real hard to see just exactly what kind of bird it is. But I'm looking out the outline of it, and I realized it was a dove. It was a dove. And it started walking back and forth on the banister. Strangest thing you ever did see. There's no bird feet up there. I've never seen it do it that before. And a dove of all things, a dove. A representation of the Spirit of God. I couldn't miss the symbolism as I sat there tired, weary in spirit. And the Lord started to speak to me. He said, I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. I delight, my delight, son, is in you. My delight is in you. You know, it doesn't matter how we feel, does it? We could be low at times. We could be tired, weary, even in spirit. And he's promised he will never leave us or forsake us. What what a promise that is for all of us. I'm going to read you a couple verses just as I start digging this morning after he spoke to me through through that dove that that, that ran up and down that banister this morning. Just a a sign. We're talking about signs this morning. A sign just for me this morning. A, a, A way in which God was able to get my attention, focus my weary spirit, in his word as I sought for different verses. And I will just read you a couple of verses before we start the message. <clears throat> One's out of Zephaniah 3. And it's sort of a prophecy. And that's the reason why I think we can claim it for ourselves, even though it is in the Old Testament. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God, in the midst of you, he is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest. He will rest in His love. He will joy over you with singing. He will joy over you with singing. Now I read you a verse quickly out of Psalms 18. Psalms 18, 19. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me Because he delighted in me. You know, the sovereign Lord, the God of all, the creator of the universe, delights in little old me. What? What was he thinking? What was he thinking? What is he thinking? But his word says he delights. He takes pleasure in me. Uh, If that was true in the Old Covenant, before Christ, how much more is it true now that we stand as believers in Christ Himself, being clothed with the righteousness of Christ Himself? This is the message of the kingdom to the world, that God is able to delight in people in His creation through Jesus Christ. This is the message of the kingdom. Of God. And that's what my message is on this morning. The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? What is the importance of the kingdom of God? As you cross over from the Old Testament, you go into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the accounts of Christ and His ministry on earth. From His birth until His crucifixion to His resurrection and His ascension. And we read through there and we see that the first person that started talking about the kingdom was was, was, was that, that weird prophet, that, that wild man, as it were, called John the Baptist. The man who ate honey and bugs and the guy who, who wore animal skins. The man who had a long beard and long hair. And he shouted and screamed. 
saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus Christ himself. He was the forerunner of Christ. He was pointing towards Christ. Christ was the fulfillment of and the setting up of the kingdom of God upon earth. And John simply was saying, get ready, change your ways, turn around, do a 180, for the, com- for the kingdom of God is coming soon. In Christ's parables, as we read through the Gospels, we often hear, we often read where it says that whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare the kingdom of God? And we see Jesus constantly talking about the kingdom of God. In March 9, 1, Christ said, He said, Verily I say to you that there shall be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with with power. We just celebrated Pentecost Sunday last Sunday. That was the kingdom of God that had finally come to rest upon God's people in power. They were, they were given the dunamis power, the, 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 the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in the, by the agency of the Holy Spirit to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom with power with signs and wonders following. This was the kingdom of God that has finally come to earth. This was the kingdom of God that had, had come and, and made its abode among men by the agency of the Holy Spirit. It, it was the way by which, not only through the blood, but all through, also through the Spirit of the living God, that man was again, once again re, reunited with his Creator. In which now, by his Holy Spirit, by his word, through the redemption of the blood of Christ, he now is able to walk with God. He was able to be the hands and feet of God upon and among and in a world that was destroyed and hurting because of sin. The kingdom of God had finally come down upon the people of God. Jesus was talking about the future in Luke 17, 21. And he's, he's saying about what is to come. He says, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. What he was saying was basically this. He's saying, he's saying there's a lot of people who are saying, hey, go over there and see this prophet. Or go over and see Christ over here. He's doing miracles here. Or he's doing miracles there. He said, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God will be within you. The kingdom of God will be within you. He is saying basically is is that God has given the ability of every believer who trusts in Christ. Every believer who has been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Every believer who is full of the Holy Spirit has given them the ability to to be the kingdom of God upon this earth. We know this was the Lord's heart. It was his, it was his heart's cry, as it were. You hear in, his, in the Lord's prayer that we just, we just uh, prayed this morning, is thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth even as it is in heaven. This is the desire of God that the will that He has that is eternal, that is sinless, that is without fault, without blemish, His will that, is, that, that resides, that has no hurt and has, has no destruction in it, it's, it's whole, it's not destroyed, that His will be even here among His people in His kingdom even as it is in heaven. This should be our heart's desire simply because it was was Christ's heart desire. I think before we go any further, there's one thing we need to realize this. That there's two kingdoms that run, run simultaneously next to each other in this world. 
There is the kingdom of God that I just got done talking about. And then there's the kingdom of darkness. And in that kingdom of darkness is, is, is destruction, is, 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 is wickedness. In that kingdom of darkness, in Proverbs it says, there's a way that seems right unto, the, unto a man, but the end thereof is death. In the kingdom of darkness, death is celebrated. Destruction it was celebrated. This is Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. We realize in, 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 the, in the wilderness when Christ had fasted 40 days, that at the end of that fast, that Satan came to him and he told him, he says, if you will bow down and worship me, all these kingdoms will be yours. Jesus never told him he had no authority over those kingdoms, did he? He simply told him, get thou behind me, for thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The very fact that Jesus never told him alludes to the fact that the kingdoms of this world are not the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are the kingdoms of darkness, and they mete out the desires of their master, Satan. And so there's two kingdoms that run alongside of each other in this world. There's the kingdom of light, there's the kingdom of God, and then there's also the kingdom of darkness, Satan himself. And the truth about it is, even though it may be uncomfortable, everyone operates in one or two kingdoms. One either lives and is committed and loyal to, 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 to the king of that kingdom, or loyal to the king of the other kingdom. And so it's an uncomfortable fact to, to have to ask myself, in which kingdom do I currently operate? In which kingdom do I currently reside? In which kingdom have I given my obedience to the Lord of that kingdom? In which kingdom am I operating in? And this is what brings me to my sermon. And my text is simply one verse. That's it. And it's Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you read that chapter in the context in which that verse was written down, you will realize that it was written from the perspective of eating meat that was offered to idols or not eating meat that was offered to idols. And the writer, who was Paul, was simply saying at the end of that chapter, he's saying, this is the bottom line to all these things that I've written to you in this letter, is that the kingdom of God is not in, in what you do or what you don't do. What he's saying, basically, he says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Spirit. It is righteousness, it is peace, and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. In our life, often, we get sidetracked with such menial conversations, arguments, and divisions. And God would say to His church today that my kingdom is simply these three things. It's righteousness, it is joy, it is peace, and it is joy. Let's look at righteousness. Let's tear each one of these down separately. Righteousness. Is it our righteousness? No, it's not. Because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so there is none that are righteous. No, not one. We all have turned, rebelled from God. We're all rebels and enemies of the cross of Christ until Christ captures our heart. 
Therefore, the righteousness in which the believer claims, the righteousness to which the person who walks in the kingdom of God upon this earth, the righteousness in which he claims is not his own. That righteousness in which he claims is the righteousness of his Savior, of Jesus Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31 states it just very plainly and well. But of him are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord only. And I added the only. That according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. You know, I see so many people in life who think that walking in the kingdom of God, walking in righteousness, is something they do. It's not something you do. It's who you are. Who you are in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not what you do. What you do will eventually come out of who you are. But don't get the, the cart in front of the horse. The horse has got to be pulling the cart or it doesn't work. It never works. And so, we are of Christ, of His righteousness. We are hid in Him. We are, we take on His righteousness. I stand before Him righteous. You know, as I sat in my chair this morning, and the dove ran up and down, and up and down the railing. And God spoke to me and said, I love you. I delight in you. Oh, I was so weary. I needed refreshment for my soul. And I realized that because of Christ, because I am in Christ, because I have put on Christ, because Christ is my righteousness, my Father can say unequivocally, without any reservation, I delight in you. And so my righteousness is of Christ. It is of Him. It is to Him that I give all the honor. It, to Him I give all the glory and praise. Because in Him I find the delight of the Father. Because I am clothed, not in my own righteousness, it's no good, but in His righteousness. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Christ is our sanctifier. Ephesians 4.24 And that ye put on the new man, putting on Christ, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That ye, Colossians 1.10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him always, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of His character or who He is. That's Colossians 1.10. And so we see that one of the first things that is a measure to where we reside, which kingdom to which we live in, in which we operate, is the righteousness of Christ in your life. So ultimately the question is, have you been born again? Have you been redeemed with the blood of the Lamb? Because if you have, Christ then is your righteousness. And then operate in that righteousness, realizing it's not your own righteousness that you offer to the Father. It's the righteousness of His Son. It was earned on Calvary by the Son. It was a gift that was freely given to me. Because of His graciousness and His mercy, He placed upon me the righteousness of Christ. And so also, if you're born again on you, you stand before Him righteous. You are walking the king's highway now. You are in the highway of holiness. You are walking in the kingdom of God, as it were. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. 
Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Christ also is our peace. He is our peace. There is no peace without Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 27, what I just quoted you is, there's a peace that the world would like to offer you. But it's faux peace. It's, 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 it's a farce. It's, it's, it's cheesy. It doesn't last. It only lasts for a moment. And Christ is saying is, the world will offer you this, this sense of hope and peace, but it will not last. He said, but the, the peace that I give you, it will last. Your heart has no reason to be troubled or to be afraid. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Grant, how can the peace of God keep me through every situation in life? How can it keep me? (coughs) You've promised me that the peace of God will keep my heart and mind. Tell me, Grant, how? I can't. Because it passes all understanding. It's of God. It's not of you. It's not of me. It's of God. But he has promised it in his word. And so therefore, he will perform it. It's another measure to which we, as we examine ourselves, and we wonder in which kingdom do we reside? Which kingdom do we stand? Does the peace of God permeate my mind? Does it permeate who I am? Or am I completely always without peace in total turmoil of soul and spirit? The the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And so joy is a measure by which, is a gift, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit by which He reveals to you that you are His and, and He is yours. It is a measure by which you can, you can measure in which I know that I'm walking on the king's highway, that I am part of the kingdom of heaven because I have peace through Jesus Christ. I want to read you a passage out of Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. <clears throat> verses 15 and 16. And it said, uh, let's stand... That's actually started 14 to 16. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about or belted about with truth, having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. As I was looking at these two verses, 15 and 16, And and I seen that really there really was no division. That 15 and 16 really is all one verse. It is, it's this gospel to which we, the gospel of the kingdom to which Christ has, has commanded us to preach. This gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of peace. It is a gospel that says you can be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is, the gospel of the kingdom, that you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Then as you go into, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to extinguish all the arrows or shots that come from Satan. As I looked at this, I thought it plays very much with the previous verses that unless I am walking in faith, unless I have trust Complete trust and faith in my Creator who, who has promised me certain promises in His Word. Unless I have complete trust in what He has said, I will have no peace. And so faith and peace go hand in hand. You will have no peace if you have no faith. Because you will have no trust 
in the God who says he will provide for you because he loves you, he cherishes you, and he delights in you. And so, in the promise of God's provision, in, the, in trusting the promise of God's provision, having faith in the provision to which you know he will in your life, will bring ultimately peace that passes all understanding. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The last one's joy. Are you joyful this morning? I didn't ask you if you're happy. You know, I didn't ask you if you're happy. I know life could be better. And I'm not asking you to be happy, happy. But do you have joy? Do you have joy unspeakable and full of glory? There's one thing. Joy is unescapable in the presence of God. This is a requirement for a person who walks on the king's highway, who is part of the kingdom of heaven, who is in obedience to the king, who follows his word, who walks in holiness, it's impossible for them not to have joy. Joy is a part of your inheritance as a believer. Joy is where you need to to, to find your resonance in. It's where you need to walk in as a believer. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's pleasures in the presence of the Father. There's pleasure there. And because there's pleasure, there's joy. Who wants to reside? Who wants to linger where there is no pleasure? But in His presence, there's fullness of joy. And pleasure forevermore. Joy also is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22. Joy is strength in the Christian life. Listen to this Old Testament passage out of Nehemiah 8.10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto your Lord, Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of, your lo- of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. In this passage, when you go back and you read it, you see that there really there was no reason for them to have joy. And yet God is telling them that you will find your strength in my joy. In my presence is fullness of joy. My joy is your strength. God is saying. My joy is your strength. How many times in your life have you spent time in the presence of God and you have come away feeling almost invincible in Jesus' name? It happens because that is what it's designed for. Joy has to be part of Christian living. It has to be part of it because it's part of the kingdom walk. It's part of the kingdom of heaven. Joy is part of the kingdom of heaven. Take your Bible, uh, turn to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a lively hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an an inheritance that is imperishable or incorruptible. It's undefiled. It does not fade away. And it's reserved for you in heaven who are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation ready to be revealed in these last days or in this last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Remember I said, I'm not asking you if you're happy, happy. I'm asking if you have joy. 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom though, even though you have not seen him, you still love him, and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You know, when you get to the end of eight, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We just, in verse 7, we're talking about trials of faith, weren't we? <laughs> and yet God requires of his people to still, in the midst of trials of faith, to walk in joy. To walk in joy. And you can do it. In Christ, you can do it. You can walk in joy. I'll be bringing a message soon, and I didn't bring it to this morning because I just didn't have enough time this weekend. But it's on the will. Remember I brought one on the mind? I'm going to bring one on the will, and the third one on the emotion. But there's a will that's involved in the soulish part of who we are, the part that's undergoing, hopefully, by the grace of God, sanctification in our life. These trials are part of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Job knew this. He said, he says, God, he says, I know the path that I, you know the path that I take, that when you have tried me, I shall come forth as gold. There's always the promise that no matter what I go through, I can walk in peace and joy. Because there's always a purpose in it. There's always a place in which he will redeem me in that situation, Romans 8.28. For I know all things work together for the good of those who love God. And so I can walk still in the midst of hardship, in the, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst, midst of, yea, even discouragement. But still have joy. Unspeakable. And full of glory. Are these three things working in your life? I see them as a standard under which we march. Talking about a standard last Sunday. Our vision being a standard. But I see righteousness, peace, and joy as being the standard under which we march in the kingdom of heaven. The standard to which we are on the king's highway is the standard to which we have been called. Is the standard to which God's purposes are done on this world to grow his kingdom here on earth. Viewing last week, we were standing in the receiving, well, I guess, what, what do you call that line? I, don't know what you, I wouldn't say receiving, that's the wrong word. We were standing in a line, and the viewing line, and, and people were coming through, and giving their condolences and shaking our hands and speaking with us, people we haven't seen for a while and people I didn't know, uh, my wife's relatives. And uh, anybody that's been part of that, it's, it's grueling. It makes for a grueling day. And it went a little bit and we're shaking hands and, and all of a sudden this elderly lady comes through and she has this uh, y young lady with her. And this young lady is bouncing off the walls with joy. With joy. In the midst of grief, she's bouncing off the walls with joy. Down syndrome, 27 years old. She comes by me, shakes my hand. She's non-communicative. She can't talk. And she gives me this card with this verse on. This is a challenge to you and me. In the midst of no matter how difficult life can get, we have a decision to make when we're in the kingdom of heaven. We have the ability to make it. We've been set free from the kingdom of darkness. We've been placed by the redemption into the kingdom of God. 
We now have been given the ability through the Holy Spirit to make certain decisions in our lives. The card she gave to me had this verse on it. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I have made a conscious decision to set the Lord before me. I will set. I will not look to the right. I will not look to the left. I will set the Lord before me. I have made this conscious decision in the midst of my trial, my tribulation, in the midst of my hurt, in the midst of wherever God has allowed me to come in my life. I will always set the Lord before me. He is at my right hand. Christ is taking up residence at the right hand of the Father. For He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. I looked this up this morning and I read further. Therefore my heart, oh, it's glad. Hallelujah. And my glory rejoices. My flesh shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. I just read that one to you a little bit ago. It's the verse she gave to me. Each one she gave the same verse as she went down through the line. She couldn't talk. Then she ran over to Diane's dad and stuck one inside of his suit jacket. A little yellow card sticking out there. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Are you walking on the king's highway? Are you in the kingdom of the heavenly father? Oh, I pray to God if you're not, that today you would make a conscious effort to submit yourself to God, to recognize the sacrifice that Christ has made on your behalf. To recognize that up to this point you've been blinded by sin. You've been blinded by the evil one. You're in the wrong kingdom. You need to become the citizen of the kingdom of God and walk in the way of holiness. Turn from your sins, repent. Accept the gift of forgiveness through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I praise God. Praise God, I have the confidence because of the Holy Spirit that I walk on the King's Highway. And I am part of His kingdom. And because I am part of His kingdom, in my life is righteousness, peace, and joy. And the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. And the power, only through the power of the Holy Ghost Himself. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. We can know in which kingdom we reside. I know I want to worship you, O King of glory. For you are my King. You are, O God, I bow before you. I honor and I reverence you. Because without you, I am nothing. I thank you for your shed blood on Calvary. I thank you, O God, for your power of your resurrection. I thank you for your Holy Spirit in which you have sent the church. I thank you, God, that we can live in the reality of righteousness, peace, and joy. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.
Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore.